Are we starting? You are live, my friend. All right. I'm just kidding. This is not Dave Savage, so we're not starting that way. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Renee Rodriguez, and I am so excited to be hosting here today with one of my dear, dear friends, the one and only Kelly Zitlow. Kelly, how are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited good, to be good. here. I am. Uh, I'm happy as well. I think today's topic, we're talking about how to how to manage through uh, this market that we're facing right now. And also, what do we do and how do we start planning through it? And so I wanted to give a little bit of a backdrop of what's happening. And I think that, you know, Kelly, if I were to ask you this question, in fact, I want to even ask the audience first, and I want you to ask to answer it second. I want everybody to go into the chat. And I want you guys right now to say, to give me one word that you would use to describe the current market that we're in. And I'm going to read those. That means grab your keyboard and type in whatever word comes to mind when we think about that. And I'm assuming, Robert, I'll be able to see those. Is that true, Robert? Will I be able to see those? You will. And if they're in Facebook, I'll post them in Zoom for you, my friend. Beautiful. I appreciate it. We got normal. Love it. Opportunity shifting, opportunistic and correction, neutral. Keep going. Let's keep them going. Uh, misunderstood, misunderstood, uncertain. So take a look at what's interesting about these. Some Actually, some positive ones, you know, sporadic. Good one, Bill. I like that. That's, a, that's one I have not heard yet. So we got some positive comments and some, you know, I would say more of the optimistic comments. And so uh, more opportunity. But I want you now to think about right now, what's your referral partners and what's your clients? How are they feeling? What's the word that you would use to describe what they're feeling right now? Fear, uneasy. Notice what's happening. Scared. Keep going. What else do we got? What are your clients? Confused, frustrated, right? Okay. So think of what somebody said, interesting. Notice that, 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 that gap between how we all are feeling, who are in the industry and can see what's going on and how our referral partners and our clients are feeling and that distance between the two. That to me spells massive opportunity to bridge the gap between those two pieces. And one of the things that we also ask all the time is, do you really think that your clients and referral partners truly know what's happening or how to respond to this? Maybe some of the more astute, uh, the, the more professionally trained, ones that are more successful, maybe they do understand. But I think we'd all know that right now, it's, it's a big gap in terms of what their understanding is. And that gap is that piece that you've heard me talk about hundreds of times, that narrative gap between what we think, what's happening, what they think, and what the media is saying, what your competitors are saying, what politicians are saying, what your negative parents are saying. There's so many different pieces that are being uh, spoken out there trying to create the narrative. And as we understand, there's this concept that I wanted to put out there. And Kelly, then we're going to come back to you because I want to get your take on this in terms of you know, what your you know, boots on the ground, what you're feeling. But we're all looking at results, right? And as we look at results in terms of what and how we behave into a marketplace, we look at results first. And when we go, okay, so what do and where do results come from? Well, results come from the behaviors that we engage in. And so we say, okay, if I, let's say I'm getting negative results or positive, let's say that I'm getting negative results here. So if I wanted to change those negative results, what's the thing that I have to do to my behavior? We all know the answer, which is to change our behavior. So if we change our behavior, we get different results. But there's a reality when it comes to behavior change. What would you guess it is, Kelly? How do we typically respond to behavior change? Do we accept it or, or do we uh, reject it typically? We fight it. We fight it, right? And so the real equation here is trying to change behavior leads to resistance, right? And so then we go, okay, so if this is the real equation, I try to change behavior, leads to resistance. There's another question I want to ask, and this is kind of what we're going to get into. And it's what drives our behavior in the first place. Like, why did we behave that way? There's a precursor to it that most of us don't know. And in psychology, they used to call that the black box. And Alex, you're absolutely 100% on board. He said mindset and beliefs, right? And so our beliefs really make up what our mindset is. And so then the question is, think about this for a minute. What do you believe that is causing you to behave the way you're, you're, you're behaving right now to get the results you're getting. And so a lot of times, especially in business planning, and this is, this is really at the core of what we're talking about when it comes to planning, because we're going to get into some planning ideas. And there's an event that we're hosting that we want to make available to the entire industry that we'll talk about in a little bit. This process here, we have to be able to analyze how we are doing. What are the results? 
things that we're really proud of that happened and things that we're not proud of, right? The disappointments and the accomplishments. That is when we do strategic planning, we look at that process and then we say, okay, here are the good things that we did. Well, what behaviors led to those good things? And we get all the empowering behaviors, the actions that we took, the things that happened. And then we say, okay, what must we have believed to be, have acted that way? Now, that's a fun process because we go, wow, I believe this and I behave that way and I got those results. Okay, I see that connection. The harder one, though, is the parts of our life that we don't like the results. Well, what behaviors did we engage in to lead those results? Because you have to take ownership over this process. And those beliefs, excuse me, the behaviors were driven by a belief. So what must I have believed to get me to stop picking up the phone and calling my realtor partner? What must I have believed to have overspent my money and not saved for this? All of those different pieces come down to our beliefs and our mindset. And so we're going to talk about this today. And we're also going to talk about the planning. So Kelly, when you see this, what, what's, what, what goes through your mind here when you see something like this? I think the thing that I'm focused on, Renee, and that I'm sharing with just everybody around me in all conversations is what we're doing today is truly planting seeds for tomorrow. And so mm. all of those activities, the things that the easy stuff, none of this is rocket science, but updating your database, making outbound calls to your database, uh, bringing valuable information to our communities to help people process what is going on and what they're hearing in the media, just chunking it down to be able to take what we know to our clients, to the community, to real estate agents. You know, so many real estate agents only know the market from 2020 on. So there's such a huge opportunity. Yeah. Now, does that mean that we're going to get a loan today? Does that mean that the agent's going to get a listing today or a buyer today? It may not mean that, but what it does mean is this thing's going to turn. And if we don't do the activities that we need to do today and tomorrow, then next year we are way behind the eight ball. So that's just, that's, it's a, it's a decision, Renee. It's yeah. I love that, that you're saying that you got to act in the times that you don't feel like acting almost. And this is the time because it does require faith to know that, okay, no one's acting, no one's running, no one's doing that stuff. So what do I have to do now that are going to create that? And I think the planting seeds of the, the, the story of the sower, story of sowing and reaping is such a critical story to remember in times like this. It's because, you know, if we think about winter, spring, summer, and fall, those seasons are cyclical, right? And they cyclical means that they come in a circle, means they come and they go and then they come back again. Business runs in a cycle as well. And we know that we can predict it. And if we're in the winter, if you will, of our time right now. Some of you may be excited this winter because you know that as Jim Rohn used to say, the job of being in the winter is to get better, stronger, and wiser. And part of getting better, stronger, and wiser is reflection. This is the time to reflect back to the results that we've been getting and the reflection back to what behaviors led to those. And so what do I have to believe now to be able to get myself through that? And so when we talk about beliefs, I believe in the cyclical nature of things. I believe in the cyclical nature of business in the seasons, in sort of emotions, all of that stuff. But it's so easy to get caught up thinking that this is forever. It's just not. It just isn't. And if you're wise, which means you've been through this process before, you know it's going to change. This happened to me in 9-11. I lost a million dollar contract and lost the entire business back because of cancellation over a massive contract. When the pandemic hit, you and I, we both, we were going through this together. I had to rethink our business. And because of that, I'm sitting in a studio where I can do things that a lot of people can't do, even like a change a camera angle on Zoom with no production crew. That was an innovation that had to happen because when the pandemic hit, I wasn't, I couldn't travel. And so I go, well, how can I make this a little bit more engaging? And that led to new thinking, new ways of doing things that we weren't doing before. Think, Kelly, can you think about like, Remember all the things that weren't happening in the mortgage industry from a technology standpoint? Well, we couldn't do that electronically before. And the pandemic hits, all of a sudden, well, yeah, we'll, we'll do it electronically. Right? What were some examples that you saw that sort of made the process even more efficient because of the pandemic? Oh, I think just how we interface, right? Zoom changed the world. Zoom changed business. Um, that, I think, um, social media, I think video for sure. Uh, mm. You know, it's just, I mean, you, you really took video by storm and you've seen amazing results. But, you know, when we think about that, just how are we communicating? We communicate so different uh, post COVID, post pandemic than we did prior to. 
our businesses, our industries have had to level up to, okay, mm. how do we do remote signings? How do we do, you know, non-face-to-face communications and business? And it, t- it didn't, what was interesting, Renee, is it didn't take long for real mm. estate and for the mortgage and title industries to figure it out. I mean, if you really think back, it yeah. hits March 2020. And honestly, you know, by April, May, I mean, we wow. were moving out of that and it was go time. That's fascinating to me that we think about that the reality is it didn't take that long. And what's crazy is that as it was happening, go back to the mindset and the feelings that you had during that time. Think about like what was going on and how scary it was and what was happening. We're in that again. And so you, you go, okay, hold on a second. You know, if some of you may have heard my analogy. If you're in a race and you're running alongside your competition, it's hard to gain ground because they're running fast and you got to run their speed plus more to gain any ground. And so you might gain a few inches, you know, like, quarter of a mile an hour faster a mile an hour it's just it's it's just feet that you're gaining but you're running so much harder that's what it was like over the last couple of years is where everybody was running but now the reality is, is a lot of your competition just stopped running and so the hard part is when you see them stop running you feel the need to stop running because of of the sort of that group think mentality so wait, what, what's going on and natural negativity bias where we start looking for risks saying if I, is there some reason i should stop running i mean collective group thought says that so maybe i should do that but when wisdom takes over, you go, no, 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 this is predictable. Times like this, a little bit of stress, people get scared, they become irrational, and they stop running, and they begin to hibernate, just like we do in the winter. You see how that comes back, that same analogy. Yeah. Jim Rohn had a great quote. He says, what a, t- what a perfect time to grow while everyone else is hibernating or sleeping. And this, this is that time. If you're on that call, you're doing that, just, just like that. And so when we think about this process here, start a- analyzing, to get to what you believe, I think you start with the results of what worked and what didn't work. And then you say, okay, so of what worked, what were the behaviors, and then what was the belief system? But you gotta do it on both. And so right now, when we're thinking about planning for the future, this is the time to start thinking about what am I planting? What am I planning for? And if I can plan better while everybody else is scared, maybe I'm planting better seeds that will harvest later on. And that does require a sense of sort of an emotional sophistication, if you will, emotional maturity to say that right now I'm doing something that I won't see the benefits for, for a while. I mean, easy analogy, imagine literally planting a seed and then going, why isn't it growing? I don't see the buds, but we know there's a process dependent events that has to be nurtured, has to be watered. It needs sunlight and it needs all those different elements to be able to then take root. And what it is, then it's beautiful. Your business is the same thing. So Kelly, if I were to ask you right now, you know, three to five of the non-negotiable activities that anybody watching here needs to be doing. And I heard you talk about database and things like that. And let's get really tactical. And if you're listening to this, this is where you grab your pen. What are those things? And, you know, riff on it for a while. What are the things that you think are most needed right now? Well, first and foremost, database. Uh, think of it as your data bank. We've gone back the last four years of all of our clients that we have served. And we are updating, making sure, do they still own the house? Um, are they in HomeBot? And then we're just making outbound calls. These calls are not sales calls. These are just love calls, right? We're just checking on them. We know that our clients are confused in some cases. They're fearful. Things are happening in their world. We just want to remind them that we are here for a conversation and just to check in. That's it. So again, this isn't sales related. This is just an outbound call just to check in on them. And I think that goes a long way because you know, they may only know you from the origination of their mortgage. And if you haven't done a good job, you might be apprehensive to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. So I think there are ways, and you can help on this, Renee, if maybe a loan officer just went through the two biggest years of their life, they haven't done a good job of reaching out to the database. What are some ways that you can frame that conversation to make it more received by that client and just remind them that you're there. I think that would be a really helpful thing for this audience. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great idea. I think right now, if you understand, there's a good question for you there, Kelly, that uh, in the chat, if you want to take a peek, I think right now is understanding that there's a lot of confusion out in the marketplace and people are making decisions even outside of their mortgage that you could process. If you're listening, you could provide some value and some insight to that won't get you another deal but it'll keep you top of mind and it'll create that sense of connection when the time that you didn't ask for something in return. And so I think a lot of folks are saying, hey, I just wanted to give you a call. If you wanted to talk about what's happening in today's marketplace, I think I can shed some light on 
what a great position that you're sitting in right now. The media is not going to tell you that, but I want to outline for you really just how great of a position you're in right now. And if you're owning a home right now, you're in a great position. Now, that word great position can be branched off into great position to buy another property, great position to just sit and wait. You're in a great position to um, maybe refinance. So there's a, it's, a, it's a concept of great position. So you're framing it in a very positive because I truly believe that people that own homes are in a much better position than anybody that is renting right now, like just exponentially. And so, and your calls, maybe 60, 70% of them just confirming that they're doing well. And, you know, are you looking at any other business, op business opportunities? Are you looking at purchasing a car? What's happening? Is anybody getting married? And how might that affect what's, what's happening? And maybe that leads into a transition as to why right now they should be looking at something else. But I think that concept of you are in a great position, and I wanted to reaffirm that is a great way to start that conversation. And from that, if you don't have home bought, whether you're a real estate agent or a lender, it's such a, a, a great tool to have because it's providing that monthly real estate digest to your client. And so it's a great reminder of you every month, but it's also just plug and play. You can see if there's activity and everybody wants to know the value of their house. Everybody's concerned about the value of their house. So HomeBot is just that automated tool that goes out every month to your database and you can do video with it. Hello. What? So you can make Who your video thought? a little bit. Well, I know, right? You can make it a little bit more specific to the moment. And I think the market mm. at the moment really is one of those things that don't let this pass. There's information today that you can bring to your sphere that they need to hear that combats some of that negativity. And they're looking for you. They're looking for that local expert and they need to hear from you. So HomeBot is just another tool to do that. Yeah, and so is so homebot. It sounds like, and I don't, I don't. Is, is it was that former homebuyers marketing? Is that what that was? No. Or is it same? so? It's, it's different. It's the same concept. Company. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you've got yeah. so so it sounds like. I mean, what a fantastic tool to help you it even is. scale. And there's a great question here. It says, if you don't have a database, what do I do? And and I'll answer this, and I want Kelly to jump on top of it. Here's the thing: you do have a database. You just haven't identified it yet. If you look at your entire Facebook friends list, there's a database. All the people that follow you on Instagram. There's a database. Anybody that you have in LinkedIn, there's a database. Anybody who gets your dry cleaner come, they're from your database. Your babysitters, their parents. Uh, the, the database is around. You just haven't identified them yet. And so this is a great time to start saying, okay, I need to start aggregating and start collecting and putting together the people that I know. Your database is the people that you work with, interact with on a daily basis. And if you keep that sort of little, little back of the mind thought, anytime you meet with somebody, that somebody comes and you're in contact with, say, I'd love to send you, uh, be, have you part of my database and send you uh, a part of my newsletter, or I'd love to have your contact information so we can stay in touch and let you know what's happening in the marketplace. If you think about constantly growing that, you do have that database, you just got to use it. And so when you think about that, Kelly, if somebody's starting off, what's the best way to really start off in creating that database? Five new people a day. So that's networking events, that's cross sell agents if you're in the lending uh, space, it's the escrow officer, you know, th think about um, homeowners insurance, even just from one transaction, that could potentially be five new people that go in your database when that contract comes in. If, uh, but again, going back to networking events, affiliated businesses, CPAs, financial advisors, financial advisors need us. They don't really understand what's happening with the mortgage-backed security market, right? They know enough to be dangerous, but this is a great opportunity just to lean into that whole sphere, just financial advisors. I met with one yesterday afternoon, just talking through, what are they seeing? What are we seeing? Creating that synergy. Does that mean that I'm getting a lead today? No, but guess what? I'm planting seeds for tomorrow because this, this is gonna turn, <laughs> it will. And we've gotta be ready for that. So that's what I'm thinking every single day. You know, I'm putting in, I have a memory jogger list that, um, I, and I'll put the, I'll put a link in the, in the, I'll give it to Robert, whatever. It's just a, literally it's a hundred things in, in on there to start thinking about who you do business with. And it's like, you know, your children's friends, parents, who waits on you in restaurants, your spouse's relevance, uh, relatives, you know, who comes to the Christmas party, who's, you know, it's, there's so many different people who tells, who, who have you attended self-improvement seminars with, who was your boss and their bosses, you know, who works at the bank, who's on your Christmas card list, you know, who's in sales trying to sell you something. You know, who goes to church with you? Who likes to shop? Who are the teachers, services, who buys your car, repairs your home, repairs your car, has children in college, manages a company. I mean, there's, you just have to remind yourself 
of the people that you already are in contact with, and then find value added ways. And if you were to say, what are the first, maybe two to three things that you can do with your database to continually add value to them? Well, video is my conduit to just bringing information to the market. And, and so I would say, if you're not doing video, leverage it. Um, it's a great way to be able to educate people. And that's really what people need. They want to know what's happening with the real estate. Our price is going to drop. Uh, what's going to happen with interest rate? What does it really mean to do a 2-1 buy down? Are there affordability options? Does it make sense to still rent and wait it out? All of these are the questions that are at hand and we have the ability to answer them. So you can go to the masses with doing that through video and basing your platform on YouTube because YouTube is the place people go to want to learn. And then there's all different ways, you know, other ways you can leverage YouTube shorts, reels, all that fun stuff. But just getting information out there, that tees you up to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, I like to think of video in two parts. When you create content for video, Renee, I'm sure you uh, would agree that you have to know your content, which means that when you and I sit down and talk, you know your content because you've already invested the time to know it, to deliver it. It's kind of like teaching, right? To, to teach, you better know. And then as you teach, you learn as well. So you're, it's, this, it's this ever growing type of function. And so the, when I do video or when I teach, I get better. And I know that I hone my craft. I get those words down. I watch the re response and the engagement. And so um, I think valuable information is the best thing we can do right now to bring to this community. Wonderful. And those of you, I mean, if you're on this call, Mortgage Coach is a ridiculous source of valuable information. If you literally could go down to the YouTube list, close your eyes and hit play on one of them, That's you're so going to find valuable, valuable information. It's, it's and when we, like, that's something I do when I'm like, I have downtime when I get ready or I drive, I listen to something that can pour yeah. into me, right? So I'm listening to all these interviews that Mortgage Coach is doing because I learned something or I'm like, oh, I like the way that she said that, or he said that, boom, I get to the office, I implement, you know? Yeah. So I think surrounding yourself, not only with the five people that you surround yourself, that whole saying, right? Uh, impact who you are or who you're going to be, but also the community you surround yourself with. And Mortgage Coach is such a great community. On that note, you guys, if you are not using the open house flyer, the co-branded open house flyer, showing seller concessions and options out of the gate through Mortgage Coach, I mean, it is such a big win right now. The market needs it. It's the market of the moment. Agents don't quite understand the impact of a price reduction versus seller concessions. A lot of seller, a lot of agents are just coming out of the gate with a seller concession to attract buyers. So using both a TCA and or uh, the open house flyer if the agent wants it co-branded, no brainers and Mortgage Coach has these built out already in there. So it's just plug and play. I love that. I mean, it's just, these are things that you, you in the, the thing I always tell people in 21 years we've been doing this in this industry is none of these are silver bullets. It's the, the utilization of all of them. And it's the multiple points of contact. And in old marketing said six times, the rule of, rule of, rule of six, six times, six different ways. I got to see you and interact with you six times, but in six different ways. And when I've done that, I've reached six times, six different ways. Now, all of a sudden, you have branded yourself onto me. So each, any opportunity you get to be a touch point, utilize it. And if you can automate it, yes, but automation shouldn't replace a bunch of in-person or three-dimensional things that you can do. Right. Phone call, text message. I mean, you, well, how do I do video? There's a video button on your phone. Send them a test, text message. You know, it, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing camera. <laughs> Utilize it. And if you don't like it, it's okay. Do it anyways. Like, nobody hey, likes it. No, nobody. nobody like, I can't stand <laughs> holding the video to myself. It's horrible. But continue to find a way to do it. This is a business that's going to be handed over to the hustler, the person that is willing to do the work. It's a great quote. It says, if today you'll do what most are unwilling to do, very soon will come a day that you'll be able to do things that most are unable to do. Think about that. This is the time to work hard. It's a great story Kobe Bryant talks about. He said, you know, most of his competition, most NBA players, you get up in the morning, wake up around, you know, eight or nine, get in the gym, let's say 10 o'clock until noon. You get a two-hour workout in. They come back, they fuel up, they rest, they're back in the gym at four o'clock to six o'clock, go back home and they rest. You get two workouts a day. He said, but what if I got up at three and I was in the gym from four to six, came back, rested, came back. I was back in the gym at nine to 11, came back, rested, eight, was back in the gym at two to 
at you know one to three came back rested and it was again again at seven to nine so that's four workouts in that same exact day and if i did that for three or five years i am so much further ahead than everyone else that they could try to anything they want to catch up the lead is so far up there and that's a mentality of growth and training do you have that same mentality in times like this and in this business the curse of this industry is that it pays you a ton of money for just closing one deal and two deals can be life-changing three well how many kelly how many deals are you closing per month right now about 10 about 10 Think about that for a minute and then multiply that out. And then during the good times, what were you doing last year and the year before? 20 to 30. 20 to 30. And yeah. still think about that for a minute. It's yeah. this is what it comes down to. How far ahead and how many seeds were you planting back then that are benefiting you right now? Yeah. Those are well, the things. That consistency is the key, guys, when it comes to marketing, no matter the season. And this is where salespeople fall off, real estate agents as well as lenders. So whether you're, you know, you can't control the volume on those, your database calling you for refinances, you know, that we saw in 2020 and 21, you still have to have some non-negotiables of marketing that happen with or without you that are going through and executing. And, and I think that if you don't have that, this is a great time to build that system in the process because this too shall pass. And guess what? This too will come again. It'll just look different because yeah. it's cyclical. It's a season. So we can take the time right now to build out these processes and systems to ensure that we are being consistent with our efforts. I love that. And so if I were to take this away, you know, we hear the word 10X all the time. Um, 10X in your market right now is not going to be easy, but can you double it? Can you double your communications? Can you double the amount of phone calls? Can you double the amount of effort that you put in? Can you get up an hour earlier, stay an hour later? During this season, during this season, are you able to do some of that? Can you double the amount of spend you, you spend on marketing? Double the amount that you spend on X, fill in the blank. But to me, during a downtime or a changing time, you double your effort. And if you can do that, the law of averages will play into your favor, period. Transactions are going to happen. The question is, with who are they going to happen? Being top of mind because you're constantly communicating is one of the biggest reasons. This isn't a loyal industry. Customers aren't loyal. They can have, I mean, I heard one stat one time that 93% of people were satisfied and above more than satisfied with the lender that they used, but only like 13% came back and used them again. So even if you offer great service, does not mean they're going to come back. We've, they forget who they did business with and they that person that just threw a flyer in at the right time at the right place. And they're like, you know, we should think about, you know, refinancing. Getting it. Oh yeah. Well, this person does it. Oh yeah. I've seen this a couple of times. We should probably just give them a call. And they're going to think, well, what does it hurt to get a quote? Now, if that person, somebody like Kelly Zitlow, they're not going anywhere after that quote. She just needed a, a bat, a shot at the title. And guess what? She's going to take that shot and she's going to win. And so you want to be the person that they think about the moment it's there. That's the power of branding. Your social media should be on fire right now. You should be communicating. Don't worry about views. Don't worry about likes. Mm -hmm. Think about the quantity and the quality of things that you put out there so people are seeing your face. I would worry more about your tone in terms of, do you sound like, oh, guys, you know, this is a, we're just trying to stay above, you know, kind of in a market like that. Even, even the memes you put out are creating the brand. You can have a hilarious meme, but if it has a negative connotation that creates a narrative that we're in a tough market, you just shot yourself in the foot. Why would you do that? Yeah, it's hilarious. But why would you then, you, you do this meme about the market and then you come out and try to be an expert. Try to align that and be congruent with what's going on. You should be the one, isn't about the one telling the jokes right now. You should be the one holding that torch and guiding people through what actually has to happen next. And I'll tell you this right now. We are, I'm, my wife and I are looking at investment properties right now. Why? Super high interest rates. It's still a great time. We're looking at it right now and we couldn't be more excited because you know what? The housing opportunity, the things that are there are awesome. When the rate changes, there's a few thousand people out there that are paid to tell me when that rate, when I can save money. Okay. And so I'm safe, I'm safe. But if I'm not in the game, I don't even have any, any chance of winning right now. Getting in the game is the most important thing. And I would even tell you this, if you can buy a house, buy one right now. You can buy another one, buy two. 
If you can buy three, buy three. So you carry the conviction into every single one of your conversations of like, I'm buying right now. Why aren't you buying? Like, oh, you're buying right now? Heck yeah, I'm buying. And I'm asking you to do the same thing. So the alignment of integrity is so strong with you. And if you if you already buy three or four houses, then talk to your parents, talk to your kids, talk to anybody you know to start getting them to do that. Because that creates an energy. I was in literally in, in a, we had, I don't know, it was like 400 real estate agents. And we did the same conversation. I said, what if every agent decided, you know, today, you're all going to get in the investment game. You're all going to start buying a house now. 400 agents moving into one market. Woof, what just happened? That's called energy. Yeah. Energy. So, Kelly, as we think of, we're, we're, we're I, I wanted to try to make this about a 45-minute phone call. I want to get into the concept of planning. Because we've got, and guys, I want you to write this date down. And Robert, if you can put it in there. On December 7th, I'm hosting an event called Designing Your Best Year Ever. This is an event that I created 18 plus years ago, and I retired it about four years ago because I'd done it so, so many times, and I've gotten so many requests to get this back. It's a neuroscience-based approach to goal setting. I have been in the goal setting space for almost 30 years, and I've started, Zig Ziglar was the first one, you know, uh, it was how to set goals, and it was life-changing to think about that. And then when I started realizing that there's, you know, I don't know if you remember the, the Yale study. You know, it was the, it was a, the Yale study that, that the 3% that actually wrote their goals down piece that did it. I went searching for that study and I found that it was not true. It actually never happened. It's the study you heard Tony Robbins talked about it. Zig Ziglar talked about it. Tom Hopkins, you know, right. They all talked about the study that actually never happened. So that got me into going, okay, so if it's not just writing it down, there's more to it when it comes to goal setting. And so a lot of people say, well, maybe we need more motivation. Maybe we need more motivation. So there's a great study that was done uh, in this book called Change or Die in Johns Hopkins University. So now every year, IBM holds this, what's called Global Innovators Outlook Conference. Every year is a big topic is chosen and they take the greatest, biggest thinkers from all over the world to bring them together to one conference. Now this particular year, the topic was healthcare. And at the time, healthcare took up a, of a $2 trillion budget, $2 trillion budget for healthcare, 80% of that $2 trillion was consumed by five behavioral issues. And I bet you can guess what they are. Smoking, drinking, eating poorly, stress, and not enough exercise. Those five things. I mean, isn't that profound? Did you know that smoking was bad and eating bad foods and exercise, not exercising and stress, that, that was bad? Of course, we all knew it. Yeah. But yet, we weren't doing anything about it. Five took $2 trillion, 80% of it. And so they go, well, hold on. Maybe we need more motivation. And so they did the ultimate motivation move. They took people that just had an angioplasty and they're on their recovery bed. Now, if you don't know what an angioplasty is, that's when they actually have to crack open your chest, chest cavity, open up your ribs, go into your heart veins and rotor root them out, right? And literally rotor root them. And that's taking all the plaque and the, and the, and the, and the cholesterol and everything out just to relieve some pain. And by the way, the angioplasty, 100% reversible with diet and exercise. $100,000 procedure. We said, okay, they're in pain, they're recovery, their life was just on the line, let's talk to them then. What a moment of leverage, right? And so they went in on their, on their recovery bed and they said, look, uh, John, you need to change or you're gonna die. You need to exercise more and change your diet or you will die. The ultimate motivator, right? What they found, this was, this was the CEO of Johns Hopkins University presenting this they found was that 90%, nine of 10 were back within two years for a second procedure, a second procedure. So when we look at this little model that we talked about before, we need to change behavior or you're going to die. They didn't do it. And the research behind why they didn't was fascinating is because when it comes to death or something that is so far removed from us, perceived far removed, we go into denial and that, it's like, for example, like we know that, you know, that French fry will probably kill people more than a, a cigarette will. But yeah, we'll still eat it because this French fry won't. And I said, okay, that cigarette. And I talked to people that are smoking. If you smoke right now, if I, wow, does that help you? Do you know it's going to happen? Yeah, I'll die. Will it change? No. It's fascinating. But what if I were to lace the next cigarette with cyanide? Would you smoke it? They go, heck no. I made one change. I took the proximity of consequence from way out here to right here. And all of a sudden, there's no way. And so then we go, okay, there's got to be something that's more associated with the proximity of consequence. This is where we get into the neuroscience. But there was another study done 
by Dr. Dean Ornish. And he did it in conjunction with Mutual of Omaha and the University of San Francisco. And what they did is they took the same angioplasty patients, but they realized that there was a much, there was a lot more factors involved in the change process. One, there was an emotional factor. There was a values factor. There was a faith-based factor. There's all these other pieces that created and needed to be involved with creating actual change. And so this was fascinating. Kelly, you'll love this. What they did is they took the person and instead of going in, you're going to change, you're going to die. They went in, let's say, for example, one story was a daughter walks in with her grandchildren in hand and she's holding on to her two grandchildren and said, dad, wow, you, uh, you scared us. I mean, you scared us pretty bad. And it's like, you know, it's like, we thought we we're going to lose you. Of course, dad was like, Hey, you know, honey, no problem. You know, I'm strong. I'll make it through this. Just like everything else. Well, dad, do you, you remember the time I got married? The day I got married? He's like, yeah, honey, it was one of the greatest days of my life. Dad, I would got to tell you, I was so scared that day. I was nervous. Wasn't sure if I was making the right choice. And I just started trembling on the inside. And I turned around and I saw you, you looked at me, you smiled and you winked at me. And the moment you smiled and winked, all of that went away. I knew I was making the right decision. And dad, I'll never forget that day. And of course, the father responds saying, you know, God, honey, you're going to make me cry. You know, I love you. And everything he says, well, dad, I don't, I don't share that story to make you cry. I share that story, but you understand how much you were needed that day. And then if you don't change how you eat and add more exercise, you're not going to see your two grandchildren get married and you won't be there for them when they need you most. That study produced within three years, 70% were not back. That is when you take science and apply it to the art of goal setting. And goal setting is always around changing behavior. And so Love it. it's yeah, powerful. wait. December 7th, yes. December 7th, but that's one of hundreds of studies that came out is another one that blew my mind when it came to goal setting. I used to think that verbally telling the world about what my goal was, was creating social uh, accountability. So they studied that. And what they found was that when we verbalize our goals to other people, the likelihood of us achieving that goal goes down. And here's why it all comes why? down to dope. Yes. Yeah, it comes down to dopamine. And so I'll give you a little quick lesson on dopamine. When we think about sort of the secretion of dopamine, I'll make this a little bit, uh, you know, I'm going to make it a bigger, thicker marker here for a second here. Let's go there. So we think about the secretion of dopamine, right? This is time. And I talk a lot about dopamine over time. And so we, we go out there and we set a goal that's out in the future. Let's say, you know, it's to, you know, lose, lose weight, right? And so, of course, Dopamine is that reward hormone. What we used to think was a reward hormone, but it's actually not. Dopamine is secreted in the anticipation of reward, in the anticipation of it. You can trick dopamine to secrete by smoking, by uh, doing drugs, you know, all sorts of other things. You can trick it. But dopamine is in the anticipation of reward. It's, that's why social media is so addicting because we go, oh, I see a little message indicator. I wonder who it is. It could be a reward. It could be. And so I anticipate and I saw that feeling it's to do that but also it works in the visioning of possibility, in the visioning of an outcome. And so we set this vision to lose X amount of pounds or earn X amount of money, whatever this goal is, or a number of deals. And as we do that, dopamine is this cheerleader along the way. But we think that we go, okay, when we get there, it'll be the reward. The moment we verbalize it to the world, guess what we've done? We get the same response from people as if we achieved it and dopamine falls short early. There's no more cheerleader, no more reason, because I already got what I needed out of it. So there's something to be said about a pursuing in silence, about pursuing something is really important. And I've known that for years. I called it the law of silence when, we, when we're looking at goal setting. When something is big and massively important, you hold it inside and you hold it in. And there's something that's there, but becomes that cheer of the moment I get to share it with people. I, I, I talked to, uh, you can use dopamine with children, by the way. And it's a fascinating thing. My son used to call me all the time and he was like, dad, we're about to go do X and say X was not a real smart thing. And I just don't know what to do. Everyone's doing it. I don't want to go, but I also know, I also know. I said, Alex, I said, I can't tell you what to do. I said, but I want you to imagine this. Tomorrow we're having a conversation. What do you want to say to me that you did? And what do you want to say that you did? And he looks at me and he's like, okay, I know what to do that. Thank you. And so now I can use the anticipation of reward to him to be able to say, dad, I didn't go. Or dad, I made the smart choice. Or dad, I went, but I didn't do this. 
in that anticipation that dopamine becomes a cheerleader to drive the appropriate behavior. And so we're going to talk a lot about dopamine on that on December 7th in terms of how to do it, how to leverage it to be able to achieve some of these goals. A lot of silence is, is a part of it. But it's really just when we understand how we function within it, now all of a sudden we're able to achieve bigger and better things. And so I know we're looking at just maybe four, two, three, four minutes here. This goal setting, and, and I kind of want to wrap this in, 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 some, in some way here, Kelly, and I want to get your thoughts on this. We talked about activities and the things that we need to do. And those of you have successful people in your office, watch what they're doing. Most of the managers that manage most know what to do. Most businesses have great resources and training materials and videos and mortgage coach. It's endless. Their YouTube channel is ridiculously valuable. Uh, we got the modern mortgage coming summit coming up. That's going to be ridiculously valuable, but all sorts of things. So you got to tap into that to help you understand what the activities are. But then we also talked about the mindset that gets you into the activities. You know, what are your belief systems? What are the things that you're believing? And now we're saying, okay, so goal setting, there's a new, there's new research out there to be able to set and achieve goals in planning. So Kelly, what, what, when you think about all of this stuff, you want people to walk away with something, what, what would you say are the biggest takeaways or maybe other tips or things to think about whether or not they join the, the workshop or not, but what are the things that people need to be doing from a planning perspective? I think now is the time to pour into ourselves. Mindset really does matter. And so what we're listening to, where we're spending our time, how we're growing, how we're investing in ourselves, we have the extra time today. So now's the time to do this. So it's really, Renee, a decision to show up. Show up for yourself so you can show up for others. I love that. I love that. It's the concept of winter time to get better, stronger, and wiser. And you know, it's interesting, you know, the story, the reason why it's time to get better, stronger, wiser from the sow sowing and reaping analogy was that's when you develop the seed. Yeah. And some people, everybody gets a chance to sow seeds and plant sowing is planting, but some people have better seed than others. Mm -hmm. If you were to look over here, I've got three bookshelves full of things that help make my seeds of ideas, seeds of opportunities of action much richer. When you're listening to something like this, you're putting good content into you to make the seeds that you're going to plant much richer and much better. And so then once we plant those seeds, though, you can't leave them alone. And planting seeds is difficult, by the way. It's hard work, the sweat of the brow, pressing it into the soil. And that means picking up that phone call one more time, going an extra mile to look in the mirror and practice that script another 30 times, going out there and Making the sales call, even though you're petrified of this person doing it anyways, that's the hard work that all of us have in front of us. And don't be afraid of hard work. We're going to talk a lot about the importance of struggle and suffering and the whole purpose of life. Suffering is okay and suffering is good. You suffer in the gym, you suffer in the kitchen so that you feel better and are healthier. You suffer picking up that phone call so that your pocketbooks and your bank accounts look better. You suffer through, I haven't done this, but I've heard you suffer through labor. So you build this beautiful child and you create a beautiful baby, but it's suffering and that's okay. Most of us run from it. I say run towards it. Embrace it because happiness is going to be fleeting. It comes and it goes just like that. Most of life is in a struggle. Most of life is pushing towards something. And if you can learn to do that for sake of some purpose that you believe in, it becomes fulfilling, which is much better than happiness. So. All that being said, we've got this event. It's uh, coming there. I'll, show, I'll throw it up on the screen real quick here. Uh, here we go. It's on December 7th, Designing Your Best Year Ever. It's a virtual event, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And on this, uh, uh, the site that we have here, if you can go to meetrenee.com as well. But um, the, what's cool, we're doing it for 97 bucks. We're doing it for $97. I mean, this is something I wanted to make available to everybody. And what I also wanted to say, and I, and I want I want to take this real serious. If you know somebody or has somebody that can't afford the $97, send me a message. I'll get them in for free. This is not something we're doing to make a ton of money on. This is something that I think this industry needs now more than ever. And if we, I'm, we're looking at getting well over a thousand people onto this call. And if everybody can be part of it, whether they have money and those that can't afford it should be on it. Please let me know. We will get them in for free. If you have the $97, do it. If you want to do a viewing party, let us know charge a nominal fee. You can show it to the entire office. If you want to buy it for your entire company, we've got a way that you can buy it for everybody to do it. We want everybody to be part of this process because it unites us and it gets us thinking around a new narrative around what we can do to move forward. So please send me a message or just go on and, and log in. 
If you want to uh, learn more about it, there's a, I did a, one of my podcasts was on it. So the video is on there as well. And so, yeah, let's all think about December 7th as a day that we get a chance to really push this industry and get moving into the winter, into the new year with wings stronger, better, and even more wise than we already are. Kelly, thank you so much for co-hosting today with me. Any last messages you want to leave? I will see you on the 7th. Wonderful. All right, everybody. Thank you. Oh, please. I have a new Instagram account. My other one has been hijacked and not hijacked. I still own it, but it was attacked. But please, if you would help me out and follow me at learn with Renee. And if you would also, I am leaving 25,000 followers for another account. We've actually grown pretty fast, but we're getting two videos a day, all educational. If you would, please follow me, learn with Renee, send me a message. I'll message you back, any of that sort of stuff. But we're building this from the ground up again. So any help would be greatly appreciated sharing and all that sort of stuff. So that being said, thanks to Dave Savage, Robert, for making this easy to put together. Um, and again, any messages, this will be up on the account. I'll try to log in as well onto the Facebook piece to ask any questions. I'm off to catch a flight. Kelly, you're amazing as always. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Thanks, Renee, for take, sharing. Take, take care, everyone. Thank you.